There's been a sharp rise in the number of police officers and staff in England and Wales accused of abusing their positions for sex. The police watchdog, the Independent Office for Police Conduct, investigated 70 people last year. In 2016, that figure was 10. Well, let's talk now to Zoe Billingham, the former inspector of policing. She wrote a report on how police can best tackle violence against women. Uh, Zoe Billingham, thank you very much for talking to us this afternoon. Um, is there any caveat, first of all, we should introduce to these figures? Because that is a pretty dramatic rise. You're, you're right, actually, Sean, there, there is um, a caveat. We, uh, as the Inspector of Constabulary, looked at this two years ago and felt that forces are really slow in putting in measures to actually root out this sort of corruption. And we made lots of recommendations of, around what forces should do. So this spike in uh, cases, this increase in cases, could actually be an indication that forces are taking this more seriously, that they're encouraging their staff to speak up, to step forward when they see inappropriate behaviour, and that they're putting enough staff in their counter-corruption units to actually get after this issue really proactively, because the last thing we want is predators in policing preying on members of the public. Um, absolutely. But even allowing for all of that, the, these uh, investigations to alleged abuse of position for a sexual purpose. I mean, was it 42 uh, complaints last year, or 42 sets of disciplinary hearings began last year alone. Misconduct of 66 officers and members of police in all in the three years. Misconduct was proven in 63 of these cases. So these, not, these aren't egregious complaints. These are complaints that in the majority, certainly not all, but the majority of cases appear to be well-founded. Yeah, absolutely. And those facts speak for themselves, don't they? And certainly when we did our report two years ago, we felt that it wasn't exactly the tip of the iceberg that we were seeing, but we felt that there was probably a lot of inappropriate behaviour going on um, where forces, frankly, weren't lifting up the stones to see what was happening within their own organisations. And we were pretty shocked to find that two thirds of counter corruption units. So these are the units that are there to actually kind of police the police within each force in England and Wales, two thirds of those counter corruption units didn't have enough trained staff in them to actually be able to follow up the lead. So if, for example, a member of staff contacted the unit to say, I'm really worried about so-and-so, he spends an awful lot of time with domestic abuse victims or making inappropriate comments, that unit can then use covert tactics mm. to actually investigate what that police officer is up to. And if those units are understaffed, then we're not going to see the proactive activity that we'd really like to see so that this corruption can be rooted out because, you know, this lies at the heart of the trust between the public and the police. And if it's not tackled appropriately, then that legitimacy of policing is diminished. Um, the case of Sarah Everard, it's impossible not to mention that in the context of these figures. I mean, uh, presumably one of the positive things that might come out of such a terrible event is that it might make both women who are approached in this way, and it is mainly women, although not, of course, exclusively, but mainly women who are approached in this way, more willing to challenge that and, in, in, if necessary, make a complaint, but also presumably make forces much more aware of what their officers may be doing and perhaps a little less intolerant of behaviour than in the past they might have treated as a disciplinary breach, but not a major disciplinary breach. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And what we have to remember in all of this is, is context. 135,000 police officers in England and, and Wales, these are still very small numbers, but any, any abuse is a betrayal, a horrendous betrayal. There should be none at all. And quite rightly, we want forces to actually be actively encouraging their staff to step forward to call these behaviours out. And if, as you say, if there's anything that could come out of the horrific murder of Sarah, if it actually means that the forces are going to root out this type of really serious corruption once and for all, then that's, that, that's important. And it's important for so many reasons, not least it restores that bond of trust between the public and the police. And I think every force in the country is, of course, looking at this really carefully uh, right now. But I think they need to be reporting much more transparently to their public. They need to be telling the public how many cases they have, what the sanctions are, and then they need to be tracking trends over the years. Can I ask you very finally and briefly, if, if a member of the public, somebody watching this now feels that some contact they've had with the police officer has been inappropriate, has, has been sexually loaded or whatever. Who, who exactly should they seek help from in the first place? They should, um, if, if they want to go and seek support outside of policing, talk to one of the many charities that supports 
uh, people in that sort of position, perhaps some of the domestic abuse charities. But I would absolutely immediately encourage anyone who is subject to any inappropriate moves on the part of a police officer to ring 999 and report it. Zoe Bellingham, former Chief Inspector of Policing, thank you so much.